Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking into the heat transfer for fins. So let's start off by just asking, what are fins and why do we want to use them? So let's say that we have a surface on an object that we would like to cool. The most common place that this sort of thing occurs is in uh, electronics where we have some heat generation just because of the energy used by the electronics, but it can happen in other situations too. So this surface has some temperature, which we're going to call Tb, just for temperature of the base, and it has some heat transfer due to convection to the surrounding fluid. Now we know that our equation for convective heat transfer is just h, the convective heat transfer coefficient, multiplied by the area of our surface, multiplied by the difference in temperature. Now the equation is set in stone, but we do have some control over some of these variables. For instance, if we wanted to increase the heat transfer, we could possibly change the fluid. So if we had air, we could change that to water, or Maybe instead of changing the fluid itself, we just change the speed of the fluid and we push it a little harder over the surface, and that can increase that H as well. Another thing that we can change is this ambient temperature. So if we want to increase our heat transfer rate, we can cool off the surrounding air and make the difference between the base and the surroundings larger. Then finally, we can change this area here. And that's what we're concerned about in this video. If we modify the geometry of our problem, then we might be able to increase the amount of area of our surface that's actually exposed to the surroundings. So a fin is simply a protrusion from the surface. We're going to make a simple one here that's just a nice rectangular prism. But the goal of this fin is just to increase the surface area exposed to the surrounding fluid. And to start off, I'm just going to define some of these measurements. So this is going to have some length L, some width W, and some thickness T. So once we have that, we can define the area of the fin, talking about the surface area that's exposed to the flow. And so that's just going to be the width multiplied by twice the length, since we have both the front and the back side, plus the thickness. And we are ignoring the front and the back here. We're just looking at the fin like so. Now, an issue that we have is that once we have this fin in place, the entirety of the fin isn't going to be at that base temperature. So we know the bottom here is at that base temperature, but because we have our heat, <clears throat> because we have convection cooling this off as we go up, we will have a decrease in temperature along the length. But before we get to that, let's just create this hypothetical heat transfer rate, which is the maximum possible for the geometry. And this comes from the idea that even though the area is changing, that base temperature is going to be the same for the entire surface. So this is the theoretical situation where the entire thing is at this TB, even though that's not real life. The reason we define this is because that sets some maximum for us, and then we can define an efficiency of our fin. So this efficiency is just going to be set to the real heat transfer rate divided by that theoretical maximum. And that's nice because this should always be less than one. Now we have a efficiency. We're also going to define an effectiveness and the effectiveness of the fin is just the heat transfer rate of the fin divided by the heat transfer rate if there were no fin. So in general, this should be greater than one because if we're designing this fin, it should have more heat transfer than if there were no fin. And we can rewrite this a little bit because the top here is just eta multiplied by the Q fin max. And the bottom, we can just leave as the Q dot of the no fin. Now, this is useful because 
the only difference between the QFIN max and the original Q with the no fin is this area. So we can say that our effectiveness of the fin is simply equal to the efficiency multiplied by that ratio of areas. And so we have two useful tools to talk about our fins. Now, of course, we can't do anything with these until we actually define what this Q dot of the fin is. <clears throat> so our next step is going to go look at the fin itself, see how that temperature changes, and see how that affects the heat transfer rate from convection of the fin. So to start off, let's draw just a little quick picture of what our fin looks like from the side. So if we cut off a little section of our fin here, and we can say that the section that we're looking at has some delta x associated with it. And then into that little segment, we have some heat transfer, which we'll call q dot in. And leaving that, we're going to have some q dot out. So far, this looks exactly like our 1D conduction. The difference is, alongside both of those heat transfer rates, we're going to have a heat transfer due to the convection out of the fin in that slice. So to write our energy balance or our heat balance equation, we have our Q in coming in, and that should be equal to our heat lost to convection and the heat going out. So just like convection, we're going to isolate this Q dot in and Q dot out on one side and have the Q dot C on the other. And the next step here is to divide by that delta X. If you remember, we do this so we can isolate the change of heat flux with respect to X on that left-hand side, but it'll work out for our right-hand side as well. So let's work through this. Looking first on just the left-hand side, we can take out the areas from both of these Q dots. So we have the area, and we're, gonna, we're talking here about the cross-sectional area, the area that this Q dot in and Q dot out see. So that is going to be multiplied by our lowercase q, our heat flux, in and out. And then this, as that delta x goes to zero, becomes the negative change in q with respect to x. And then we're going to use Fourier's law to change out this q with a k dt dx. So this becomes an ACSK, and there's a negative sign in Fourier's law, so we end up with a positive d squared t dx squared. And that's pretty much all we can do with that left-hand side. And this looks pretty much the same as it did for just the 1D conduction. Now our right-hand side, we have this q dot c over delta x, and we can change this out using the area of that surface there. So that area, we're just going to call the area of the perimeter. And that's going to be multiplied by an H times whatever the temperature is at this point minus T infinity, the temperature of the surroundings. And we still have this delta X. Well, the area of the perimeter here is just the perimeter itself multiplied by delta X times H. And the rest of that stays the same. That's divided by the same delta x, and so we can actually cancel out those delta x's now. So what we're left with on the right-hand side is just a p times h times the difference in temperatures. Now, it's a little bit of a pain to write this over and over again, so we're going to define a new variable called theta. And theta is just the difference between the temperature and the surrounding temperatures. So with this new definition, we can take a second derivative of theta instead of t and end up with the exact same thing because the second derivative of constant is just zero. So this d squared t dx squared just becomes a d squared theta dx squared. And so rearranging things just a little bit, we can get that d squared theta dx squared. Then dividing through by ACSK, and then subtracting that to the other side, we get a negative pH over ACSK times that same theta, and that's all going to be equal to zero. 
So this is a lot to write. And so we're going to give that a name as well. We're going to say that that is m squared, which means that our m is just the square root of pH over a c s. Okay. Now, once we get to this point, there's a very simple solution that we can use from ODE. And we can say that theta, which is going to be a function of x, is going to be equal to c1 times e to the mx plus c2 times e to the negative mx. And this is just a direct consequence of this equation down here. So this is a general solution. In order to get a specific solution, we need to have some boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions we're going to look at are the temperature or the difference in temperature from the surroundings at zero. And we're going to call that temperature theta b, right? So our tb is at zero. Our theta b is just the difference between that tb and the surroundings. And then we're going to look at the theta prime at l. So theta prime just meaning the change in theta with respect to x at l, so at the tip here. And we're going to make an approximation. This is not going to be exact. In reality, we should have some convection boundary condition here, but those are real pain to work with. And this is typically small compared to everything else. So we can just call this zero. We can just ignore that heat transfer there and get a good approximate solution. So with those two boundary conditions, we can plug those in uh, and it's a bit of legwork, but we can end up with the solution. And that solution is just theta b multiplied by the hyperbolic cosine of m times x minus l divided by the hyperbolic cosine of ml. And just as a quick reminder, that hyperbolic cosine is going to be equal to e to the x plus e to the negative x all over 2. Now that we have the temperature profile, we need to figure out what the total heat transfer because of this fin actually is. And we can get there two ways. So the total heat transfer from the fin, we can write it as the integral from 0 to L times the perimeter times the heat transfer coefficient, the convection heat transfer coefficient, multiplied by theta of x times dx. And what this is, is just an integral. So it's just looking along the entire length and calculating all the convective heat flow out of the fin. But that's not the only way of looking at it. If we go back to this picture, we know that if we look at the all the heat flow into the fin here, that should all be leaving due to that convective heat transfer. This should be the exact same thing as that heat flow in at the beginning. Well, we can write that as a K times our cross-sectional area times the change in temperature with respect to our X location at that initial point at zero. So this way of thinking about it is just all the conduction going in at the base of our fin. These are two sides of the same coin. And so either way you choose to solve it, you should get the same answer. And that answer is just the square root of H times the perimeter times K times A C S, that cross-sectional area. All that multiplied by the temperature at the base multiplied by the hyperbolic tangent of the mill. And just for completeness sake, that hyperbolic tangent is e to the x minus e to the negative x all over e to the x plus e to the negative x. And it turns out that is the hyperbolic sine divided by the hyperbolic cosine. Now, once we have a value for this heat transfer, we can actually take this and plug it into our efficiency of the fin. The end result is that our efficiency is going to be equal to that tan h term here divided by just m times l. And just a reminder that we do have a definition for m, which plugs into that equation. So the key pieces that you need to know for this are the area of the fin, since that gets plugged into our effectiveness over here. We need to know this formula for the efficiency. And then this m gets used in multiple places inside that efficiency. So with all of those pieces put together, we should be able to figure out for a given geometry what the heat transfer rate is and how effective it is at actually 
increasing the cooling rate of our original plate. So those are the basics. And I'd like to challenge you to go back and kind of figure out some of these intermediate steps. Specifically, try to perform this integration and show that you can actually get this formula for that Q dot of the fin, or alternatively perform this differentiation and get that same thing. And then plug that into your efficiency equation up here and show that you can indeed get that efficiency of the fin there. Now, one of the tricks there is that you have to ignore this T. You have to assume that that thickness is a lot smaller than the length. And so ignoring this piece because it is small is one of the requirements for this final derivation. In any case, good luck, and I will catch you next time.